So we're, so we're in the chapter on gas power systems. Uh, we're covering internal combustion engines. I don't even think I'll be able to get the diesel engines or diesel cycles today. It's just all gasoline auto cycle. Uh, but then uh, we'll get to Brayton uh, cycles, modeling uh, stationary gas power plants, as well as what's under the aircraft wings, like jet engines for aircraft propulsion. And then uh, we'll get to compressible flow. So uh, just a quick review. This is a picture of an engine that's in a car that I own, a 3.8 liter uh, V6. It's in a Buick. Uh, there's a lot of these General Motors engines. They're pretty robust, pretty well known. Three coils. There's one, two, three, four, five, six spark plugs going down to one, two, three spark plugs on both sides. Um, the bore is the diameter. The stroke is the distance moved from the bottom dead to top dead center, the stroke. The displacement volume per one cylinder, the displacement is pi b squared over 4 times the stroke. And if you have six of them, you just multiply by the number of cylinders in that engine. The clearance volume. So this volume right here, I tried to color code it. This color and that color, okay? Um, when the piston's at bottom dead center, that volume is made up of two components. One is the volume that will be displaced as it sweeps toward top dead center, that volume we just calculated. So you can see that that's been swept and gone, but this is still remaining. That's called the clearance, clearance volume, primarily just in that uh, hemispherical shaped head. Lawnmower engines are just flat. There's no hemispherical shape to it. The old uh, um, L head or whatever flat head Fords, etc., uh, before the 50s when General, not General Motors, Mopar, uh, Chrysler came out with the hemispherical head, the Hemi. Um, they were just flat uh, combustion chambers. Anyway, um, so the compression ratio R is the symbol for the compression ratio. That's equal to the volume at bottom dead center divided by the volume at top dead center. That's a quick review. The mean effective pressure is another st uh, metric of a cycle. So let me do this because this can be confusing. The they ask you, calculate the mean effective pressure. What exactly is it? And why would it be of any use? Well, when we had the actual cycle, we had atmospheric pressure. And then we went through where it was going from, uh, that the volume was at uh, bottom dead center to top dead center. And the, as you compressed, the pressure was going up, up, up. You had some combustion occurring near top dead center, had a very high pressure. You undergo expansion all the way down. You had a quick blowdown. It, then you were going through an exhaust stroke, then you're closing the exhaust valve, coming back for an intake stroke, and that completed the cycle. That's like a PV diagram of an actual uh, internal combustion engine, spark ignition. And we said, well, let's model it uh, with a uh, auto cycle approximation. So think about this as still atmospheric pressure, and you still have the same uh, top dead center volume and bottom dead center volume, and we'll start at atmos nearly atmospheric pressure at top dead center. We'll go through a compression stroke, then we'll replace the combustion by just constant pressure or constant volume heat addition, so the pressure goes up from state one to two, then to three, then you expand the power stroke down to four, and then heat rejection. Wasn't that our approximation? to the more complex actual cycle. So this is our auto cycle. Well, let's even make it easier because what is this area right here inside the cycle on a PV diagram? Yeah, the network per cycle. If this is a specific volume, then it's a lowercase w net in kilojoules per kilogram, a specific network of the cycle. 
Well, it's approximately, if you forget about this area in here, it's approximately the same area. That's why we're trying to model it. It's approximately the same, okay? So it's not precisely the same at all. But let's do an extreme simplification, an extreme simplification for this cycle. Well, think of your atmospheric pressure coming across. And if you just think of it, it's kind of like, well, this is my difference in the pressure for the whole cycle, right? We'll just make it where you go from uh, bottom dead center to top dead center. And you're just going to do it like this. Make it a box, you know, or whatever, the rectangles, just on that PV diagram. And so what is this pressure right here? That's the mean effective pressure. What is this difference? This is, uh, per unit mass basis, the displacement volume, just like it was here. Displacement volume, just like it is there, too. I mean, it's all this, the difference in the volumes or the displacement volume. So you would think that, okay, well, here is my net work of the cycle per unit mass. We want that to be the same as for the auto cycle, and that allows us to define the mean effective pressure because isn't the work net of the cycle the mean effective pressure times the displacement volume? Sure. And so that's how you actually calculate the mean effective pressure. You would first calculate the net work of the cycle and divide it by the displacement volume. I'm not a big fan of the mean effective pressure, but it's just another metric. And this book likes to throw it out as, okay, you calculated that, now calculate this, calculate the mean effective pressure. It's like extreme simplification. All right. Solve a problem. I think we started this last time. So we have an auto cycle. And uh, I encourage you, when you start a problem like this, you start your sketches. It's going to be really helpful if you have both the PV as, as well as a temperature entropy. All right, so we make our diagrams, and you're going to make two tables, two tables to help you organize your work and be more efficient, aren't you? One is going to be a property table. One is going to be a table of your uh, work and heat transfers for the four processes of our standard auto cycle. So it's traditional. We start one down here. We go up in the compression, two, just a constant volume, three, back down to four. We're just resketching what we sketched. And on a temperature entropy, it's one to two. Then it's it, you're increasing temperature and bringing in entropy during the heat transfer from two to three. Three to four is isentropic, four back to one. So there you go. That's our cycle. Okay. So I know that uh, I want to put a, a table of uh, properties. Let me put them over here. Let's put uh, state. And then I'll put pressure in kilopascal, temperature in Kelvin, and maybe specific volume if you're new to the game, meter cube per kilogram. But you really don't need this specific volume. But it's nice to have it if you're new to the game. State 1, State 2, State 3, State 4. And there's our table. And uh, we also are going to have a, um, a, a table of properties. We'll do the process uh, 1 to 2, process 2 to 3, process 3 to 4, process 4 back to 1. And we're interested in Q as well as the work. Both are in kilojoules per kilogram, units, kilojoules per kilogram. And right away, in this table of processes, there's two of the Qs and two of the Ws that are zero. And so for a process one to two, which is zero? Q? Q, Q is zero. For process two to three, W, then Q three to four, and W. So those we know right away. All right. Now, as we read the problem, we're saying, okay, so it operates with 300 Kelvin and 95 kilopascal at the start of compression. Well, that's state one. So it's 300 Kelvin and 95 kilopascal. You can actually calculate V1 right now. How do we calculate V1 right now without reading any more in the problem? 
exactly ideal gas law. Is that equal to R T1 divided by P1? Yes. And then a quick review, is R equal to R bar divided by big M? I can't remember. What is big M? Motor mass, 28.97 for air. You can look it up in the table, what, uh, first table in the appendix. And R bar, universal gas constant for all ideal gases. And then R, we would say, oh, that's the specific gas constant for air. Yeah, that's right. You even have it memorized by solving a lot of problems. All right, so we can calculate uh, V1 if you wanted to. I think I did calculate it. Let me look at my notes. It's uh, 0 0.90627 meter cubed per kilogram. You don't need to calculate it, but you can calculate it. All right, let's continue on. Um, the compression ratio is 9.5, so we tuck that information somewhere. R is equal to 9.5. And the maximum temperature of the cycle is 1,100 Kelvin. Well, there's only three other temperatures. It's either T2, T3, or T4 that they're giving us. And you look at the temperature entropy diagram and the, which state has the highest temperature? T3. So we put in our 1100 100 Kelvin right there for T3. And then they say use constant specific heats at the 300 Kelvin. So you can go get out of the table C sub P, C sub V, or K. Okay, so you can get C sub P, C sub V, or K out of the tables. And then uh, we start the problem. And basically, even though they're asking the temperature at the end of the compression stroke, isn't that T2? Even if they didn't, sometimes you just fill up the table, okay? And you, then you can pick it off because for part B, the peak pressure, isn't that P3? So let's just work through it. How would I calculate T2? Well, S is equal to a constant compression, isentropic compression. And then we recall these three relations out of thermo 1 that we spent a lot of time deriving in thermo 1, they are only applicable for an ideal gas. They're only applicable for constant specific heats. And they're only applicable for processes that are isentropic. But, and what they do is they relate properties like temperature and pressure, or temperature and volume, or pressure and volume. For the auto and the diesel, we are going to use the last two. When we get to the other part of this chapter, Brayton cycle, we're going to use that one. But for right now, oh, I'm going to see that I'm going to do isotropic compression from 1 to 2. I'm going to calculate T2 is equal to T1 times V1 over V2. That's just the compression ratio to the power K minus 1. So for this problem, we start at 300 Kelvin, I believe, and our compression ratio is 9.5, and K is, for air, this table, 300 Kelvin. Those are my value for K, the value for C sub V, and the value for C sub P. So the K is 1.4, so it's... 0 0.4. If you have a calculator, can I get at least three people to run this calculation with me? And when I get the right, when I get confirmation of the answer, and the answer for the temperature should be 700. 38.3 Kelvin. So I have one confirmation. You have a second? Anybody else? I got it. You got it too? All right. So if you don't get it, you know, check with your friend next to you or see me after class or office hours or something. But we don't want to lose any points on trivial mistakes, do we? All right. So we go ahead and we put 738.3. What about P2? It was this equation right here. So we have P2 is equal to P1 times... 
the compression ratio V1 over V2 to the power K. P2 started at 95 kilopascal, 9.5 compression ratio, and K 1.4. Can somebody run that? 2,221. I just want two other confirmations. Yes? Thank you? Okay, we got it. So we got 2, 2, 2, 1. So the answer for part A is already right there. It's a 7, uh, 38 Kelvin. I'm not going to box it. I'm running out of room. But And then let's get now P3, the maximum pressure for part B. What is that P3? How would you calculate P3? That's exactly right. That's always an ideal gas, and they have the same volume. So what you can do is you take this number, you divide it by the 9.1, the, and you'll have the specific volume, 0 0.09540. You don't need to numerically calculate it, but it's the same value. So these V2 and V3 have the same volume, true? It's constant volume heat addition from 2 to 3. So if you start with that equation, that V2 is equal to V3, and then you say, oh, I know what V is. V2 is RT2 divided by P2, and V3 is RT3 divided by P3. The R's cancel. They're on both sides. And then you get that the pressure at 3 is equal to the pressure at 2 times the temperature at 3 divided by the temperature at 2 just using the ideal gas equation twice. And using that, we calculate that it's 3309 kilopascal. All right. Let's just wrap it up. Let's get 4. What is the temperature at 4? Well, you're going to be going isentropic expansion from 3. So we start at 3. And it's not the compression ratio, but the inverse of the compression ratio because it's expansion by the same amount, by the same ratio, to the uh, K minus 1. And when we calculate that temperature, it comes in at 447. And then what about the pressure at 4? Well, it's the pressure at 3, 1 over the compression ratio times the p p at K, exponent K. And that comes in at 141.5 kilopascal. So we, we, we march through. We have all these pressures and temperatures. We have the answer for part A, for part B. Now, what is that net heat addition to the cycle? Well, it's right down here. The sum right here is Q net. But I have to calculate Q2 to 3. How do I calculate Q2 to 3? First law. For the process 2 to 3, it's going to be C sub V, T3 minus T2. And we picked up the C sub V from the appendix. We just have our temperatures. And it comes in at 259.7 kilojoules per kilogram. That's the heat addition from 2 to 3. How about from 4 to 1? Very similar. Q 4 to 1 is... C sub V T1 uh, minus T4, and you'll pick up a negative 105.5. When you sum that column, you get that Q net is equal to 154.2 kilojoules per kilogram. That's the answer for part C. What is the net work for the cycle? It's exactly the same value. It's, it's W net is equal to Q net for the cycle. And I encourage you to go ahead and calculate the work one to two as you're learning to solve these problems efficiency, efficiently and correctly. 314.7, the work from three to four is a positive 468.9. And when you sum them up, they don't look like they're going to give you the same value, but it gives you the same value, 154.2. And if it doesn't, look for an error. Look for an error. What is the thermal efficiency of this auto cycle? Well, I didn't leave myself a lot of room, did I? 
Um, how about this? The thermal efficiency is the net work out of the cycle divided by the heat in, and there's only one heat in, which is in the process 2 to 3. So W net divided by Q 2 to 3. And I'm going to uh, just give you the value. The efficiency, thermal efficiency is 59.4%. What about the mean effective pressure? Man, I didn't leave enough room, did I? I have to scroll down, sorry. So the mean effective pressure is the work net of the cycle divided by V displacement. Now, if you're calculating these volumes, you can go and get the displacement volume. No problem. That's the difference between V1 minus V2, or that's how you calculate it. And so the mean effective pressure comes in at 190 kilopascal. There's a convenient unit conversion. A kilojoule is a kilopascal times a meter cubed. Is that true? Is a kilojoule a kilopascal times a meter cubed? It is, and it's a very convenient, helpful unit conversion in this chapter. Any comments, questions on this problem? Yes, sir. As you, the way I did it was, uh, I just didn't really stop and compute these two. I just used the ideal gas equation twice. So I had uh, V displacement equal to. Well, let me let me let me develop it a little bit. Is equal to V1 minus V2. V1 is R T1 over P1. And V2 is R, so I pulled the R out, T2 over P2. And that's, that's the way I did it. Okay. It's essentially the same way. Uh, there are the results in uh, Excel. It, all of these numbers are easy to put in Excel and run. Now, one of the very interesting things, as I showed it right here on this Excel, is you can calculate the thermal efficiency of the standard auto cycle using the calculations shown in the table right here. That's the way we did it. Or a very simple equation, and I did a little typo right here. The equation is the thermal efficiency auto is 1 minus, I left off the 1 minus, 1 over the compression ratio raised to the K minus 1 power. That's pretty incredible. You mean it really doesn't matter the starting pressure, the starting temperature, the peak pressure, all this other stuff? It, it really just boils down to the compression ratio? It does. And uh, what you find is that that really drove uh, motor enthusiasts for many years, especially early on 50 years ago. They would always push to get the compression ratio higher. But it wasn't just the manufacturers or the engines. They had to figure out what fuels the customer could buy and the quality of those fuels because they didn't want to fill it up on one day in one city and somebody else put it a different day in the same city or later on. And he had a different, the refinery gave you a different batch of gasoline and it ran terrible. So they had to get a very stable, good, reliable fuel source. But over the years, of course, fuel sources become more reliable and they know what is the important metric to the engine performance, and it's a avoidance of self-ignition, known as knock. And so even to this day, when you select gasoline, we'll talk about it, that's what you're picking. You're picking your anti-knock index, and you're paying for it with a premium fuel for higher anti-knock. But over the years, you would find that the compression ratio inched up and up, when they introduced uh, leaded gas, I forget in the years 20s or 30s, there was a spike because then there was a reliable fuel source coming from the refineries which pretty good high octane, but they had added lead to the fuel. And that's what the lead did. That was the purpose of the lead. So the manufacturers followed suit and started putting out cars that had higher compression ratio and more performance. And then uh, took the lead out, which they needed to, uh, but then with the advent of like aluminum blocks and aluminum heads and uh, other performance, uh, you were able to uh, cool and have it where it was um, less susceptible to knock. But this is a very important equation uh, that's 
known in engineering, and you should know it too. Now, I normally derive it. I've derived it before. I think it takes you seven minutes to watch the derivation. In the interest of time, can I just encourage you to derive, go watch the der derivation? The same thing with the diesel cycle. What is that, eight minutes or so? Please watch the derivation. It's in our textbook as well, or it's outlined in our textbook. Now that I want to talk about the octane number. So when you pull up to the pump, you either pay a lot or not so much. Well, it's a lot either grade, right? <laughs> but it's unleaded, super unleaded, or you know, unleaded plus. And right here on the tab, typically they're showing you that number. That number is not the price. That number is the anti-knock or the octane number. It's really the research and the motor divided by two. Different people, you know, they develop it along, and, and they had two groups had different measures of the octane number, and finally they needed to blend them, and they just averaged the two and called it that, and it's worked out well. Okay, it's a it's a measure of the anti-knock properties of the fuel, and really, if you have isooctane C3H18, it's 100% octane. That's your benchmark. But gasoline is a blend of a lot of hydrocarbons, not just a few, a lot. Some are very volatile. So what is this knocking? Well, you want the spark plug to initiate the combustion and the propagation of the flame front to go throughout the combustion chamber very uniformly. And actually, it's very complicated. They have swirl and tumble in, their, in the fluid motion. But if you have a problem where you have a hot spot and this is starting to propagate, it'll actually compress the gases a little more somewhere else. And because there was a little hot spot there, it'll have self-ignition and now this is burning or this is burning. And now you have multiple or two or more wave fronts and they hit each other because they're very highly, there's a big pressure difference across them. And that gives you this very harsh knock and then it has an effect on uh, pressuring the valves and pressuring different parts of your engine. This is premature combustion is bad. Now I'm going to ask a question. This was when I was a kid in the 60s. Is I would remember a car, you would see it where somebody had an old station wagon or something. They'd park it, turn it off, get out, and walk away, and the engine would just sort of rumble. I bet nobody in this room had that experience one great thank you very much anybody else know what i'm talking about you see a car it just continues to run first of all it's carbureted so as you're drawing air through fuel is being mixed right so carburation is gone pretty much i mean in the mid 80s carburetors were gone but then once you're going like that the uh it wasn't a spark that continued it but it would compress, and then just on one of those eight cylinders, there'd be some enough to really get it to pop, and then it would go for another round, and then it would go for another round. And I remember sitting there as a kid watching somebody get out of the car, walk away, and that thing ran for like two minutes. But that's what's going on. You remember something like that? Yeah, yeah. Shaking the whole body. Then the other one is uh, you buy a car and uh, you put in some gas and then you'd pull away from the r red light when it turned green. You'd romp on it and it'd start making all kinds of racket in the engine. That's knock. Well, with the advent of knock sensors, electronic controls, they retard the timing. Even though you got your foot on the gas the whole way, your c engine's going to prevent itself from hurting itself. So those are kind of gone. But does anybody remember in a car, driving a car like that, being in a car when somebody's pulling away? You've seen in movies? All right, well, go buy an old junker car and enjoy life a little, right? Um, but yeah, the, but, but now with the, you have a knock sensor on every cylinder. And so with the computer electronics, it's controlling a lot of that. But it used to be more state of the art that you had to worry about it. But anyway, if you pay a lot of money for an automobile, and the automobile has a decent engine in high-performance engine. This one I pulled out of a BMW owner's manual. You can find the chapter, the section on fuel specifications. And right here, what do they say is the minimum? If you own that car, they've designed it to run on a minimum of 91 AKI anti-knock index. So when you pull up to the pump, 
Can you put in 87? Nope. 89? Nope. You're right there with 93 because you need it 91 or more. But you know what? If you could afford that car, you can afford whatever fuel. True? I mean, really. I mean, it's just a couple 20 cents, 30 cents more a gallon. Whoopee. Um, but uh, there you go. That's your octane uh, out of the owner's manual. How many people have checked their owner's manual or know what their minimum is? Did I ask that last time? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of this on Friday when I went home after our lecture, I was listening to this radio, NPR. And I'd like to play, it's only about three minutes long, this article on gasoline and octane ratings. Did anybody hear it issued on Friday? One other. That's it. Well, let's listen. Hopefully this will be. For American drivers who choose premium at the gas station, AAA has a message. Unless your owner's manual calls for a premium, you are wasting your money. The association says that more than 16 million Americans buy premium even though their cars don't need it. And AAA has a new study that's found that premium does not improve performance or gas mileage in those cars. Greg Brannan is the director of automotive engineering for AAA. Welcome to the program, Mr. Brannan. Thank you, Robert. And first, tell us what the difference is between high-octane premium gasoline and regular gasoline. Well, the difference is really related to its ability to prevent uh, detonation or uh, that knocking sound that you hear in the engine from time to time. Those of us that are old enough to uh, remember cars that didn't have the advanced technology that they do today will remember a time when that was much more prevalent. But really, the higher the octane, the better the uh, gasoline is at resisting that detonation or pre-ignition. Well, tell us about the test you did uh, to see what the effect is of premium gas. We use something called a, a, a chassis dynamometer, which, or dyno for short, which is more or less a treadmill for a vehicle. And through some very specific tests uh, following EPA guidelines as well as a uh, wide open throttle horsepower test, we were able to very scientifically quantify the difference, or in this case, the lack of difference in both uh, performance, emissions, and um, fuel economy as a result of uh, placing premium in a vehicle that, uh, that is only calling for regular fuel. Why do you think so many people, uh, more than 16 million people, spend extra money to buy premium if, in fact, there is no benefit whatever to using it with a car that's not designed for premium gasoline? It's certainly an interesting question, and uh, as, as the report notes, over $2 billion have been wasted annually on that practice. I think it comes down to uh, simply the naming, premium. You put premium on the pump, and the consumers likely believe that it is a premium product over the others on the, that they have available to them, and therefore are making that selection. It may also have something to do with carryover from a good time ago when cars weren't as advanced as they are today, and premium fuel may have helped with uh, that spark knock or detonation for those of us that are old enough to remember cars that did that regularly. You would buy no-knock gasoline in that case. It would, be it would be advertised as such. Exactly, exactly. Well, Mr. Brannon, if, if over 16 million Americans have been overpaying at the pump of uh, buying premium for cars that, uh, for which there's no benefit in, in using premium gasoline, have they been doing any damage to their cars by, by using premium? They have not. Uh, the only damage is to their wallet. Well, on that note, thank you very much, and happy cheaper motoring. <laughs> thank you. Greg Brannan, who is Director of Automotive Engineering for AAA. So, do you remember that? You, you Only one person heard it. So, uh, let me do this. I'm grabbing out of the report a couple things. One is... They estimate here uh, ownership and what, how many people really need that higher octane. And they estimate that 70% of us just need regular gas. And that there is some that 16% need the premium and then 10% need the mid-grade. And then what is the price difference? Uh, you pay about 11% more or 22% more for those higher grades of gas uh, out of that report. This is very interesting too. Now let me do this, if I can do paste. So they tested three vehicles on the chassis dynamometer. They did the 5.7 liter V8 Toyota Tundra pickup. That was one pictured. 
the 2.0-liter uh, inline four-cylinder Mazda and a 3.6-liter V6 Charger. And they put in 87, 93, and they ran it city-city, uh, which is very standard. It's a, a mapping for how start, stop, accelerate, coast, start, stop, accelerate. EPA has that for emissions. And they noticed that they get essentially the same MPG. This is MPG. Versus if they put a highway scenario onto the chassis dyn dynamometer with the 87 and 93, you can see a difference between city driving and highway, but not between the fuels. And they also do aggressive driving and aggressive driving on these two, but they didn't they do aggressive driving on the Toyota, which is different. But you find that the city highway, city highway definitely has a difference but not the grades of gas. And they also measured horsepower as well as fuel economy, no difference. So I thought that was just very interesting that uh, sometimes somebody will tell me, oh, I went on a long trip and I just put in pure high grade, highest grade octane, and man, my fuel economy improved. Well, what he did was he, he went on a long trip, mostly highway miles. <laughs> mostly highway miles, and yeah, you do see an improvement in the fuel economy. So you can get that report and read it. Um, the, uh, I was flipping through it here. It really is good reading, and it's very low tech, so to speak, just basic um, information. All right. Back on track. That's how much money they estimate. Can you imagine how much money some consumers, you know why they do it. I've felt that way too, right? You know, you wash your car really, you know, do you clean out, even vacuum the engine, compar engine compartment? You buy yourself some favorite beverage and while you're at the gas station, treat the car to the favorite beverage. Must be premium is better, true? There you go. So that's what a lot of people do. How many people name their cars and talk to their cars and, you know, celebrate the car's birthday? Something like that. Do I have enough time for another problem? Good. I hope I do. This is very much like a homework problem, so I hope to be able to accomplish a lot in solving it. We have a four-cylinder, four-stroke internal combustion engine. So we're kind of going from the real to the auto cycle approximation and back and forth. So we're going to come back and need to know that it's four-cylinder. And we have a four-stroke internal combustion engine. It has a bore and a stroke that's given. With that, you can calculate the displacement volume for one cylinder, right? So if you calculate the displacement volume for one cylinder, which I'm sure that everybody can do, you calculate that it is, where do I have it, my numbers? No, 0 0.00471 cubic meters more digits in my calculator. The clearance volume is 12% of the cylinder volume at bottom dead center. What are they giving us? They're giving us the clearance is equal to 0 0.12 of volume at bottom dead center. Using that information, can you get the compression ratio? What was the compression ratio? It was volume clearance plus volume displaced divided by the volume clearance, isn't it? So what, is, how, what do you calculate for the compression ratio for this problem? 9.3333333, good, very good. And uh, the crankshaft rotates, there's a different symbol, whatever, different books use something for the rotational speed of the crankshaft, but it's 2400 RPM. What does RPM stand for? Everybody here in this room knows that, right? Revolution per minute. But now, if I take, does that mean it, the, the actual engine is undergoing 2,400 cycles per minute? Or crankshaft revolution per minute? Crankshaft revolution. Now, think about that piston. It has four true strokes. You start at top, you go around to bottom, that's one. Go back up to top, that's two strokes. 
That's half the cycle. One rev took half a cycle or, or co accomplished half a cycle. So you need two revs for one cycle. And that's a factor of two that a lot of students will miss. So, um, so two revs equal to one cycle. True? Okay, now let's continue on. The process within each cylinder is modeled as an air standard auto cycle with the initial pressure of 90 and temperature of 310 at the beginning of the compression. The maximum temperature is 980. First of all, go ahead and draw the PV diagram. We're going to draw a PV diagram that's going to look just like our standard auto cycle. Basically, we're neglecting this little trip of the exhaust intake. Just call that equal. Forget it. Okay, like no work in or out net of the cycle. And then what we would want to do is we want to go ahead and march through the calculation, uh, starting with this pressure and temperature state one, the maximum temperature. We would fill a table of properties. We'd be able to calculate things like the work net of the cycle, the net work of the cycle in kilojoules per kilogram just like what we did for the auto cycle. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. I'm just going to say that you're able to calculate the network for the cycle to be 105.1 kilojoules per kilogram. We pause. It says for one cycle, if it had a trapped amount of gas, which was one kilogram, I would get a network out of 105.1 <coughs> kilojoules. That's what really it that's what it means, true? Okay, so now we've solved part A, solved part B, the hard part. What is the power developed by the engine in horsepower? Yes? Is that work only for one cylinder? Well, that's a good question. Uh, depends if one kilogram fits in one cylinder or 0.25 kilograms fits in one cylinder. So it really is kind of not per cylinder yet. <laughs> uh, if, if I took and I could take W dot, if I could calculate M dot and multiply it by the net work per unit mass, wouldn't I get W dot for the engine? And I need this mass flow rate for the engine. That's really what I need. I need the mass flow rate for the engine. So how do I calculate the mass flow rate? Displacement volume for one cylinder multiplied by four. I have the displacement volume for the whole cylinder. The way that way the rate at which it's completing cycles. That's right. And one of the little things to worry about is it takes two revs to complete one cycle. That's right. So. Um, how, you could do this. You could say it's that uh, that it's 1,200 cycles per minute. See that? Isn't isn't that? I, I'd have to make up a new symbol for that, but it's that's how many cycles there are per minute. Now, how much air is sort of swept through the engine? You're sucking it in as well as blowing it out in a cycle. How many kilograms of air? are sucked in and thrown out per cycle. Use the displacement volume per one, so, you, so let's do this. Displacement for one cylinder. We'll calculate it for one cylinder. If I can multiply by the density of the air, wouldn't that be then the mass for one cylinder, right? How am I going to get that density of the air? Well, it's ideal gas equation at state one because that's when we're, we're drawing it in. We stop it at state one. We start in the auto cycle. This is state one right here. Nearly atmospheric pressure, nearly atmospheric temperature. It's filling it up. So that's going to be the uh, um, uh, pressure uh, one divided by RT1. All right. And then we were able to get that displacement volume for one cylinder. That's doable. We've done something like that. So what is this product right here again? The mass 
of air that swept through one cycle, one cylinder. Right? And so you, to get the mass flow rate through the engine, it would be like 1,200 cycles per minute. You can see you already have that per unit time. And then for each cycle, you pick up the, um, let's do this, you have um, uh, four cylinders for the engine because we want the mass flow rate of, through the engine, not through one cylinder. All right. And then for each cylinder, we're going to have the, uh, the mass that goes through per cylinder. And, and that mass we just calculated is the displacement volume for one cylinder times the, uh, the density of the air at state one. You really need to work through that yourself. Don't memorize equations as well as, as be able to rederive them or, or understand them, okay? But I think I've given you enough of a hint on that. Oh, you convert kilowatts to horsepower. The conversion factor is the front page or two of our textbook. Thank you for your attention.